America. It's the land of immigrants, home to a plurality of cultures. But when does cultural identity become lost in the melting pot? And when do individual notes become lost in the chorus? That's me, Chinese American boy, born and raised in an all-American city, Sacramento, California. I have a typical American name, Casey, and a common Chinese surname, Chin. I grew up in a gi and ride my bike to school. My dad, well, he idolizes the cowboys of the Old West while working on his Harley Davidson in the living room. My mom doesn't speak Chinese, but she's pretty good at Spanish. Yes, life is quite American and seems far removed from my family's cultural heritage. My grandparents, Wing and Lily Chin, left their home in China to establish a new one in America over 70 years ago. But they both passed away before I was born. Why did they leave China? Their lives, their stories, and my own heritage are a mystery to me. But all that changed when I got the chance to leave America for the first time and go to China on a reporting internship. Like my grandparents, I was in an unfamiliar place. And for once, I felt like I didn't belong. Two months later, I took a 20-hour train 1,400 miles across the country to find my grandparents' village in Kaiping City. For the first time in my life, I would be face to face with my ancestral roots. Okay. So, I just arrived. I'm looking for my aunt right now. I've never met her before, so I've only seen a picture of her. Let's hope it goes well. Hey, I see my name. Casey Chan. Hey. <laughs> How are you? Oh, Casey, I'm Casey Chen. I'm. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. I'm Rio. Hi, I'm Rio nice to meet you. Oh, okay. Thank you. This is your cousin, Tamina. Oh. Tamina, hi. Oh my. <laughs> it's so good. I've talked to you guys. Hi. Casey. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh. Well, I'm here. <laughs> yes. Yes, welcome home. I want to share so much with my family right here and now. There's just one problem. I don't speak Chinese, and I thought my auntie spoke some English. Yes, you you guys have been writing emails so long. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so need a translator to translate you know, your email so that they can understand it. Which means I'll need translators the whole time I'm here three to be exact. The next few days are a blur of new faces and names. Everywhere I go, someone wants to meet the estranged American relative. I'm told that much of the family hasn't gotten together like this for almost 30 years. It's because uh, they, different people, they have different words and their schedules are different, so it's pretty hard for them to get, uh, have spare time on the same time, but today they all want to see you. However, it becomes clear to me that everyone at the table was either too young or not even born when my grandparents left. Still, I hold out hope that some answers await me. My new family and I pile into a van and head for Bao Yan Fong, my grandparents' old village. But first, my family wants to take me to the church and school my great-grandfather founded. The only problem is finding it. Not sure of the exact location, we go to a nearby school which has the same last name. Uh, family name is the same, but I, I saw the name there, it's different. Yeah. That last place wasn't um, my great-grandfather's school or church. But the director or superintendent, someone at, this, at that school is now in the van with us and he's going to take us He's going to take us to the actual church. We're almost 100% certain it's the one. And we're here. This is the location. 
Yeah, sure, this is the location. See the, the cross. Yeah, I see the cross. Founded in 1919 with money my great-grandfather made in America, I find that the church has a colorful history. It was closed for 15 years during the Cultural Revolution, then torn down, rebuilt, expanded, and later moved in 2002. All that's left for me to discover here is that the old building is now used as a plastic processing factory. The day was ending, and we need to move quickly to get to the new location. Wow, it's a lot more impressive than, than the, uh, the original one I saw. But it's closed right now, so I don't know, we'll probably have to, have to come back some other time. It looked like we were running out of luck, but then... Our savior here, he uh, called and was able to get someone to come out and open the doors for us. I think they're really lucky I heard the lady talking about there's not any business today. They're going to leave. Yeah, they're going to leave. If we call, the, if we call her, one, maybe two, one, maybe three minutes later, we can. We would have not have got in. So, wow. Your grandfather blessed you. <laughs> we finally found the place, and I wasn't the only one excited. <laughs> First time this trip that something so real came over right now. I mean, I'm standing in a church that wouldn't be here if, you know, if my great-grandfather never decided to, 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 do this with, to do this with his life. Although I'm not religious, I can't help but be amazed by my great-grandfather's legacy. But before I can see my grandparents' old house, I need to negotiate with a relative who uses the place for storage. He said I should treat the entire village to lunch. After my auntie rejects his first idea, his next pitch sounds a little more reasonable and more than likely is his true goal. To honor my family, his mother will perform a ceremony. All I have to do is cover the expense of the offerings. When I ask him how much everything will cost, he says he'll tell me after the ceremony. Paco saying he's confused <laughs> that we need to go through so many uh, customs and procedures. My funds were shrinking by the day, but with few other options, I reluctantly agree to it. I'm really surprised that this actually still looks like a village. My interpreter said the government is actually protecting these buildings, kind of like a historical historical site. This one? What? Holy crap. Just this building here. Um, so what are they, what, what is going on right now? They said that all the things here is going to carry out the consensus worship. Do anything to help or do we feel like we do it? At this moment, can I help? Honestly, I don't know what's going on. So I'm just trying to do my best to not get in the way or mess up the customs or trip on the, the, trip on the altar. <gasps> oh, shit. Um, I just knocked that over. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, oh, I did it wrong. Yeah, you're supposed to back. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Maybe we should do it again. This was my grand grandfather, my great grandfather, and it goes back and back the main chun where I came from. As I explore the house, I can imagine my grandparents living here, husking rice, cooking in the kitchen, going about their daily lives, 
not as strangers like me, but as people at home. I can almost see my grandmother sitting by the window, thinking about joining grandpa in America. When their first daughter died at the age of two, my grandmother decided to leave China. At 22 years old, she became one of the few women from the village to journey abroad. She never returned. Part of this ceremony is dedicated to their first child. Just show her. Okay, there's somebody come back to see you. Now we're buying you money. Hope you can feel comfortable and happy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The ceremony ended up costing 300 yuan, or about 44 US dollars. Money I'd say was well spent in the end. As I leave the empty house, I realize I'm a generation too late. People that knew them have long since moved, or have passed away. When my grandparents immigrated, they took more than the clothes and shoes they packed. They took their stories with them. I, I guess it's kind of interesting. I mean, I came to try to find find out who my grandparents were. In the end, what I really found was the family that was already here. You don't have to share a language to know that 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 you care for each other. It may seem like I was really lucky, or it was like a miracle that I'd found the church, the village. I don't really think it was luck or a miracle or anything like that. It was just it was my family. And my family out here that that made everything happen. To them, I'm eternally grateful. In China, I found a new family, but to find my grandparents, I'll need to return home. Coming back to America is a simple matter for me, but welcome signs like this didn't greet my grandparents. I learned from my Aunt Bessie that nothing was easy for my grandparents when they came here. My grandfather came first in 1922. He came as a merchant. If you looked at the papers, it was full of lies. I guess you, had, you could be a student or a merchant. And he lied and said he was a merchant for 10 years. Both of them came when it was illegal for almost all Chinese to immigrate to America. Merchants as my grandfather claimed to be, were allowed in. Or as my grandmother claimed false kinship. For your grandmother to come, she had to have false papers. To learn more about the laws at the time and how the Chinese circumvented them, I talked to Robert Barty, a professor and scholar of Chinese immigration at UC Berkeley. Well, the Chinese Exclusion Act. The original law was passed in 1882, it was extended, and it was for 10 years, and then it was extended for another 10 years, and then it was extended indefinitely. And it was in effect until 1943. And there were only a very limited number of categories of Chinese that were allowed in. But if you were born in the United States, you're an American citizen, and you're entitled to come in with any of your dependents, wife, children. My grandmother said she was the dependent of an American citizen. Interestingly, the nearby Bancroft Library has the false paperwork she used to fool immigration. Her sponsor, Yi Woon, who she wasn't actually related to, claimed she was his daughter on paper. In effect, she became a paper daughter and his family became her new relatives. And so it was very much a cat and mouse game. The immigration authorities, and they knew what was going on. Everybody who came through got grilled. Some people were asked 15 or 20 questions. Some people could have been asked 100 or 200 questions. Okay? And these questions, the idea was they would ask you the same questions over and over, but in slightly different ways. They would focus on discrepancies in your answers. When my grandmother came, she claimed she was the daughter of Yi Woon, an American citizen. Um, of course, she had no real family here. Uh, but these are all the notes that she studied that an immigration officer would ask her to prove that she was indeed the daughter of Yi Woon. 
I later learned that one of my grandmother's paper relatives is still in Sacramento. Stanley Yee's grandfather was her paper father. Your grandma uh, using a paper from China to, to get over here. They're asking you all kinds of complicated uh, questions. They want to make sure it confuse you or something. something. So before you came, you have to prepare all this uh, question and, and answer. Like I came over uh, with uh, the uncle. He missed uh, one questionnaire. We, we have to stay in uh, immigration for three months because my uncle say something is not corresponding to what I said. They have God standing over when you go eat lunch or dinner, breakfast. They let, they let you out like a prisoner. Luckily, my grandmother slipped into Seattle, Washington with little trouble. After traveling east to briefly join my grandfather in Washington, Pennsylvania, they both packed up and headed back west. But they didn't go to the large Chinese populations in Southern California or San Francisco's bustling Chinatown. Instead, they went to Folsom, California. It's a big gold mining town. I believe there are over 3,000 Chinese gold miners in and they were chased out of Folsom, California. This is the 1800s, but by the time we got there, around 1939, there were only four families. My grandfather supported his family with Wings Cafe, an American diner. I've been thinking about it, I think 15, 16, and 17. You used to come into the restaurant? And have pork noodles. Oh. That was my favorite and it was 55 cents a bowl. My husband used to eat there, and he came home from servicing 46. Oh! And he liked the hot roast beef sandwiches. Despite the success of their restaurant and their growing family, China wasn't far from their minds. They always hoped to return, but history prevented those dreams from ever becoming reality. My grandmother was lucky to leave before the Second Sino-Japanese War began in 1937. Her village would later be occupied by Japanese troops. There's a photograph of two of her classmates, and one of them died during the Japanese occupation. After World War II, all of China was again embroiled in war. Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek clashed for four more years until the communists eventually claimed victory. We were going to go to China to see my, uh, meet my grandparents, because oh. we'd never seen them. And then my relative from China said, don't come, the situation in China is very bad. The older people, they used to go back to meet their relatives and get a little culture mm -hmm. and then come back. But we weren't allowed to do that. So that's why we ended up in Sacramento. Shortly after arriving in Sacramento, California, my grandfather's health deteriorated. In 1948, he died from cirrhosis of the liver. He was originally buried at East Lawn, outside. And at that time, I didn't realize it, but I guess there was discrimination, so the Asians were all buried in a certain section. When these attitudes changed, my grandmother moved him into the mausoleum in 1972. Your great uncle Ken is buried in your grandfather's gravesite. Your grandmother's very practical. She's not going to waste any money. <laughs> Such frugality would prove crucial to raising five children herself. In 1951, she started a cafeteria out of her house, and for the next 11 years, she served cheap school lunches to students from William Land Elementary. And the real reason was not to make money so much, but she got her wholesale license. So once she got the wholesale license, she could go anywhere and buy stuff cheap. As her kids grew up, she began giving more of her time to the community. She baked cupcakes for William Land Elementary's PTA meetings and even hosted a Thanksgiving dinner for the faculty. She invited all the teachers, and I'm sure there were 20 or 25 of us, and she has this spread out there for us. But the, the fun part of it all was she offered us a little jigger of brandy prior and kind of uh, thought that's nice because in those days you didn't think of offering a teacher a drink. Besides being active in the community, 
My grandmother was a shrewd businesswoman who bought and sold numerous properties in Midtown Sacramento. Quite surprising, considering that housing subdivisions at that time still discriminated against minorities. Um, at that time, they had everything was redlined. Uh, we, the Chinese, mostly the Chinese, could not live on the other side of Broadway. So we were all in this small area. It was shocking to see just how black and white the laws were, and that under these restrictions, property wouldn't be rented or leased to Hindus, Africans, Japanese, Chinese, or Mongolians. They went as far as restricting property ownership to the Caucasian race forever. But if persons not of the Caucasian race be kept thereon by a Caucasian occupant, strictly as servants or employees, such circumstances are not a violation. Fortunately, legislative action ended such practices, and by the 1970s, race, religion, and sex could not be discriminated against. In fact, um, my, it was my girlfriend that, um, it was all over the papers, this black family bought this property and, you know, they built the house and everyone on the block, the whites, they all moved. This is in the Land Park area. Anyway, it was my girlfriend and I remember asking mom, I said, mom, what do you think of this? And she said, oh, now we can move in if we wanted. <laughs> By this time, my grandmother was quite comfortable. The property she rented out was more than enough to cover her simple lifestyle, which is why I was surprised to discover that she left the city for farm work in the surrounding Central Valley. Yosh Yamada, a local tomato farmer, brought her on to hire and manage over 50 field workers. See, because we met her, um, it simplified things. She's the one that supplied the, the labor. When you gather 50 people, you're often going to have somebody that's sick, uh, somebody that can't make it. Mm -hmm. But she always filled those places very quickly. What happened when she was sick? I don't think she was ever sick. <laughs> I can't remember her when she missed a day. Many of the workers she hired were women from China who spoke little or no English and were generally uneducated, not the type of resume most employers sought out. She didn't have to really go out and work on a tomato harvester, you know, but she cared about these people having jobs. And the only reason why these people have these jobs is because of her. I feel very fortunate because, uh, like everybody, you have your biological mother. And then uh, I also have a great uh, mother-in-law. And then there's Lily. She treated us like, like we were her own kids, you know. So I guess a day on the farm wasn't that bad. Oh my God, that was awful. <laughs> we, we, she was short, one worker, and she said, you can help. So this machine would go along the tomato plants and it picks all the tomatoes. So you're standing on this conveyor belt and you take all these green tomatoes and you throw it off the conveyor belt. But you have to remember, this is a tractor and we're on a farm and it's dusty and it was awful. But as strong as her spirit was, it couldn't prevent her from contracting cancer. The nurse called and your dad answered the phone. And then he told me, she wasn't telling us, we didn't know. My grandmother passed away January 1st, 1980. But even when she became terminally ill, she was always working, always planning. She made all the arrangements for her own funeral ahead of time, including ordering the memorial lunch and dinner. And she told me to ask for a discount too at George Clump. She said they know her there. I'll never know them as they lived, but as I learn about their lives and the challenges they faced, I better understand how they became a part of America's fabric. I realize now that it's not about how Chinese I am or how American I am, because I'm both. It's about remembering everything my grandparents did to make that possible. 
the last thing I find in my search is a letter from my grandmother to her grandchildren, written before I was born. Now, 30 years after her passing, I can hear the advice she couldn't share with me back then. For some 30 years, I've been separated from my family in China, my mother, my in-laws, my relatives. I wish we could meet again. It's so difficult. I'm sad with tears in my eyes. You should remember how far you have come. Be wise and astute. Honor your elders and appreciate your good fortune. Be honest, upstanding, and hardworking. Always remember where you came from. I imagine these words could come from any first generation immigrant. America, it's the land of hyphens and the land of immigrants. We all have different homelands, but here we share a common experience together.